on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. I thought it was just me being weird and kind of slightly deluded, believing I could create huge success. But actually, if you believe you can create huge success, then you feel great. And then you are so much more likely to take the actions that do in fact create success. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome. It's The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. And me, Mark Dawson. And for those of you watching on our YouTube channel, Mark Dawson is in a new location. You're in the barn. I am. Yes, I'm in the barn. It's lovely. It's a, it's a beautiful sunny day in England when we're recording this. It's, uh, it's very warm. And in front of me, I have the River Avon through a great big glass window. And there are some swans going around. And there's a moorhen that I think is making a nest, uh, which is quite nice watching him go backwards and forwards with bits of straw and twigs and things like that. Um, so it is, it's, yeah, it's lovely. I'm very it'd be, pleased to be here. It'd be quite funny in the next Milton book if, if us readers notice he starts becoming a bit of an ornithologist. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's uh, almost certain to be the case. Um, but yeah, no, it's been, a, been about a year worth of um, blood, sweat and tears to get here, but it is worth it. It is it's really lovely. And cold, hard cash. Quite a lot of cold, hard cash as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, the house that John Milton built. Um, it looks lovely and uh, the shot looks great, uh, sort of uh, almost Cubeskian, Cubian, Kubrickian, I can't say it, Kubrickian, I don't know. It <laughs> looks like Stanley Kubrick would have, may have done ah, it. Ah, right, okay, yes. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, we're in the kind of, the, in the on the mezzanine level, so there's a kind of, a, as for the people who are not watching, there's a, uh, the ceiling has kind of um, timber boards and it does look a little bit like uh, going off to an infinity point, which is yeah, quite yeah, interesting. Too- Kubrickian. Um, great. Okay. Well, welcome to your barn. And uh, and it's a busy time coming up for us here at the self-publishing show because we have our live event. Uh, and I'm going to give you some information, some particularly interesting information uh, if you're not coming uh, to the event in just a moment. Before then, Mark, I think we should welcome some new Patreon supporters, which is your job in your new barn. Yes, so I don't have uh, locations of these uh, generous souls, but it's Chelsea M. Cameron and Sean O'Connor who have um, uh, supporting the show on uh, Patreon. And another link for Patreon. Let's test you with that one. Um, it, what's it the link? Is, is Patreon or patreon.com forward slash self publishing show. Yeah, so um, we're very grateful for it. Still got you know, hundreds of people actually support the show, and it's really, uh, it's really uh, gratefully received all the help that they, they've been able to give us over the years um, makes it easier for us to put on this slick well-oiled machine such as it is, such as it is. Um, yes it is um and uh, you get an opportunity if you're a gold subscriber you will go into the draw for a very copy of or a license to ads for authors uh, in august when it's going to be open again um, so we have our show, our live show in London, the self-publishing show 2022, the second time we've done it. It will be the biggest indie conference in Europe, uh, inspired by our friends over at 20 Books who put on fabulous events. I went to the Madrid uh, one very recently, a couple, uh, last weekend as I'm speaking. Um, but our event will have at least 700 people. Um, the capacity is very close to that in the hall once we've added in the staff and, and people backstage. So we're into the last few numbers of tickets. There are, as we speak, it is possible to buy a ticket. I noticed on the website today, but that will change in the next few days. So if you wanted a ticket, go to self publishing show. So self publishing formula.com forward slash SPS live. However, for those of you not coming, we are investing not just in, in, it's not like a live stream, it won't be live streamed. Also, I think the quality of live streaming is variable from the conferences I've, I've been a part of. But we are packaging each session up professionally, as you'd expect from self-publishing formula. We always have very high production values in the stuff that we do. So it'll be professionally shot, recorded sound-wise, packaged up into easily digestible bits and put together as a bit like an online course afterwards. And we're going to have some really good sessions here, uh, sessions with actionable insights as well as author author inspiration moments in there as well. Uh, and you can get all of that for the absolute bargain price of $25. And we've made it as cheap as possible to fund the video production side of things. Um, but 
that will go up after the show. So the show is on the 28th and 29th. If you buy the digital ticket after the 29th, i.e. from the 30th of June onwards, it's going to be $40, $40. $40. But until then, you can get it for $25. Uh, the price of a few cups of coffee uh, if you go to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash digital. So that's the URL you need to buy a digital ticket to the show forward slash digital. Uh, and it'll be delivered. I think last time they were really quick. It was like three days after the conference. They delivered all the material and we were able to get it up live within a week. We'll aim to do that again, but I can't guarantee because we're doing two days rather than one day this year. So there's a fair amount of video editing and we want it to look good, but it will be within, I would say, certainly would say within 10 days of the, yeah, end of the conference. Also, so if, if you're thinking about, um, you want to see what it would look like, if you go to that link that James just um, read out, there is uh, kind of a highlights video that you'll see there. It is, it is a really well put together package. We don't do the filming or the editing. We actually got some pros to do it for us. Um, and it did look great. So apart from, you're not pleasing all the really shocking picture of me on the front cover. I need to speak to John about that. Um, but looks all right. Uh, mm, yeah, it's an action uh, shot. Yeah, it certainly isn't it? something like that. Um, so you you get the speakers there, and you'd also be able to watch uh, the highlights uh, video from the last time, which is will give you an idea of the quality that we we try to make sure that uh, the video is produced with. So definitely one. Yeah, I mean it's it's a. It, it, I mean apart from being a fun thing to watch, there will be things that um, uh, you can take away from those sessions. People like Joanna Penn and um, Nick Stevenson. Lucy School, all the people we mentioned before. Mark Reckler is a late addition. Yes, After, Mark Reckler. Um, a very good uh, presentation in Madrid. We decided that we'd, we'd have him on as well. Susie Quinn, uh, Stuart Bache, Alex Newton from Kalytics, uh, several Amazonians before on stage, all, all quite senior, um, and we've taken questions. So tons and tons of um, stuff that you'll be able to um, benefit and from. Ja and Janet Margo, who also did very good sessions in yep. uh, in yep. Madrid, uh, really actionable insights on that. They went down a storm. So I think it's going to be a really high quality conference, a good balance. Uh, so that pen, you talk about your pictures, that pen pick of me on the digital page, that for all the world looks like I'm an assistant English England coach very low down in the rankings and the in the way the England team work. Probably the person who looks after the drinks. Yeah, the water the boy. Matches. Yeah. The water boy, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so anyway. it's, yeah, it's going to be good. We, um, as we record this now, we just had a meeting talking about the last bits and bobs. So um, we, I, I feel reasonably comfortable, actually. Catherine's doing a very good job, and I feel quite confident that she's on top of it. Um, so all that really remains for us is to turn up and spout some nonsense for a bit and then um, enjoy everybody else. So uh, yeah, it's going to be a good, good event. Looking forward to it. Yeah, Catherine has been organising it this year and she's doing a really good job. And in the middle of her organisational stint, uh, she found out she's moving. Her husband's job is changing. He's a farmer, yeah. David, known them for years. He's moving out to Norwich. So he, she, I think Catherine's moving like the day after the conference or something. So she is, um, she's at DEF CON level one. It's as we I, remember, I remember he's a farmer, isn't it? Um, Partridge has problems with farmers, doesn't he? Yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> so it's surprising that you're friends with him. But um, anyway, it's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, she's done a good job. I've actually got I've got a proposal for off air, perhaps about something else we might want to think about doing um, okay. another conference. But we'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Farming, yeah, far, farming, farming, and self publishing. Now, this is apropos storytelling. I'm going to just going to ask you: Have you seen Top Gun Maverick yet? No, I haven't. Um, oh. I really, I want to, and every, everyone. Everyone, everyone, literally everyone I know loves it. Um, so yeah. I think there is a sometimes there's an element of an echo chamber that people kind of go, you're almost obliged to love it. But I think um, the reviews are so strong. I, so yes, I do want to see it, but I also want to see Top Gun before I see the second one because I haven't seen Top Gun for years. And um, Mrs. D will come to the cinema. I'll probably be out of the cinema by the time we see it, uh, the way things are going. But I'd like to see the first one before we see the second one. Yeah, good. Definitely, I would I would recommend going to see it. And I think it's an interesting one to think about if you're doing sequels uh, and taking stories on, having that right balance of mm. of treating the first one with respect and um, but then moving the story along so it becomes its own thing, which is uh, yeah, I think what they've got right with uh, with with Maverick. And you can just gape at Tom Cruise, and I don't care where you are. Uh, and people, some people don't like him, but you just look at this guy; he's 59 years old. He's unbelievable. He really is. He's, he's a bit like you and me, Mark. You know, he's just a testament to what the human body can look like. At, at, uh, mm -hmm. as they get I'm on. not 59, James. So you're closer than I am. I am. I am. Um, okay, right. 
Uh, I think it might be time to move on to our interviewee who's uh, going to give us uh, a really good instructional tour today because she teaches at Cambridge University, teaches thriller writing at Cambridge University. And not only that, Sophie Hannah has also authored an, a Poirot novel. She's basically become Agatha Christie today, uh, which is a really interesting story. And uh, not many people get to do that with the approval of the family, of course. Agatha Christie, I think, probably the must be the best-selling. She, I think she is the best-selling fiction author in the world. I think. Um, I think I read that somewhere. Anyway, okay. uh, certainly certainly going to be up there, isn't she, uh, Agatha yeah. Christie? And taking on that mantle, writing a modern day, well, a prior novel set in the 20s, but um, uh, all the challenges uh, that in that entails. But Sophie also teaches, as I say, she teaches a master's uh, course on thriller writing at Cambridge University, which is the best university in the world just down the road from me. And it's something you can actually apply to be on and take part in as a part-time course. Uh, however, we want to talk to her about her publishing experience. She's trad at the moment, but with envious eyes looking at the indie world, you can tell from this interview, and she makes that quite clear at the end. So let's hear from Sophie Hannah. Then Mark and I will be back for a quick chat at the end. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Well, Sophie Hannah, welcome to the self-publishing show. You know, we can't interview Agatha Christie because she's not alive anymore, <laughs> but we can interview somebody who's written a Poirot novel, which is quite exciting. Among the many things we're going to talk to you about, let's start with that. How did you end up writing a Poirot novel? It was my agent's idea, and I would never have thought of it. So when people say to me, as they often do, how did you persuade Agatha Christie's family to let you write a Poirot novel? I'm always slightly aghast because it would never in my wildest dreams have occurred to me to do any such thing. My agent had the idea. He was in a meeting at HarperCollins, who are Agatha Christie's publishers, and he was sitting next to a shelf of Agatha Christie books. And the meeting was nothing to do with me or Agatha Christie. But he was looking at these books and he remembered that I was a big Agatha Christie fan. And so he just sort of interrupted the meeting and said, hey, Agatha Christie's dead. And... Why don't you get someone to write new, you know, Christie brand novels? And I've got a writer who is a huge Christie fan. And wouldn't this be a great idea? And at the time, HarperCollins said, no, 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 the family, would, the Christie family would never want that to happen. But it later transpired that the Christie family were, were considering that very thing at that very moment. And they told HarperCollins that they were thinking of commissioning a new book, at which point HarperCollins said, huh. That's a coincidence. We had this agent in our offices recently who thinks he's got the perfect author for that very thing. And then a meeting was arranged and we discussed, you know, what a new Christie brand book might look like or what, you know, what would we want it to be? And we just got on really well and decided we wanted to do it. And how do you then approach that? I mean, I imagine quite a lot of considerations in in writing a contemporary Agatha Christie book, dated nature of some of her writing of the era, do you want to make it feel like it was written back in her era or do you want to take the essence of a story, type of story she wrote and write yes, them today? The only contemporary element of my, my... I've written four Poirot novels so far and I'm working on the fifth. The only contemporary element of my Poirot novels is that they're written now rather than in the past but they are all set between 1928 and 1932 that was when we decided they would be set which i sort of think of as poirot's like golden age so that was when i wanted to be writing about him um and so they absolutely do if i've if i've done my job right they do read as though they were written at the time um which obviously you know i had previously only written contemporary fiction uh which it transpired, you know, when I tried to start writing something that was set in 1929, I was like, oh, it's actually much easier to write something that's set now mm. because you don't have to keep thinking, hang on, is this thing that I'm about to write about something that existed at that, you know, I know what exists now because I'm yeah. in. But with my first prior novel, I constantly had to research whether the things I wanted to put in it were things that existed in 1929 and some of them were not. <laughs> yeah. So that was convenient it's uh i mean i write books in the 60s and even that makes me stop yeah. I see expressions like folk he focused on something it's wording that it, you don't realize actually is quite modern they may have yeah, said concentrated exactly. or something back in so yeah i i know there's challenges but uh, an amazing thing did you feel daunted 
Well, it's so interesting. That is probably the question that I have been asked most often in relation to Poirot. Was I daunted when this whole proposal was mooted? And I think the truth is I probably I probably could have interpreted the, the emotional state I was in as daunted, but I didn't. And I think that made it easier and more fun for me because I, I certainly felt like, oh, I'm writing a prior novel. But I chose to define that feeling as massive excitement combined with a sort of acknowledgement of how important this was and how much it mattered because this was the queen of crime, Dame Agatha Christie, who I adore. I mean, she literally is my favourite writer of all time and I, I worship the ground she walks on. So it was really, really important to me to do a good job and sort of serve this kind of, you know, um, amazing crime writing icon um, and it was incredibly exciting as a creative opportunity so I just chose to think I'm very excited and I'm very aware of how important this is I think if I'd told myself that it was a daunted feeling I might have discouraged myself because daunted sounds not very fun <laughs> like you don't want yeah. to feel daunted. whereas really challenge you know a, an exciting creative challenge that in order to meet it, I would have to become an even better writer than I would want to become if I was if I was just, as it were, writing a Sophie Hanna book. Like I always try and make my books as good as they possibly can be. But that thought of writing Poirot made me think I have to be even better because this is for Agatha Christie. So, yeah. you know, he's super important. And that challenge, which felt like I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it well. And that was exciting. And I just chose to see it all as a positive thing and an inspiration rather than a negative, scary thing. Yeah, very good. And the genre expectations for an Agatha Christie novel, I imagine the genre expectations for the type of contemporary thriller you write haven't really changed. I mean, she helped form that, that whodunit expectation. She absolutely did. But I think depending on what bit of the genre you're operating in, the expectations are different. So if you, I mean, the, the purpose of sort of a blurb of a book and the opening chapter really is to lay out your stall and make what I call the story promise. Yeah. And the story promise should make it very clear whether this is a puzzle based mystery. So is the reader going to be reading on in order to have a satisfying solution to a baffling puzzle? Or is there going to be some other motivation, like finding out a lot about realistic kind of financial crime in downtown Sheffield or whatever? So uh, I think there's so many different compartments of the crime and thriller genre um, that in the puzzle bit of the genre, which is where I am, even when I'm writing psychological thrillers, contemporary psychological thrillers, I am very much a puzzle focused writer. Like there's a mystery. The main reason I want readers to read my books is from a desperation to solve the mystery. That's I'm all about the mystery and suspense. So in that sense, that hasn't really changed since Agatha Christie was writing puzzling mysteries that she wanted people to be desperate to know the solution to. But I think both now and then there were crime writers writing thrillers with a completely different set of priorities, like, for example, Raymond Chandler, who famously said various versions of who cares who done it. It's not about the plot. Plot doesn't matter, which I could not disagree with more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, in the puzzle compartment of the crime writing world that, you know, the, the same priorities of entertaining the reader, keeping them in suspense, delivering a satisfying solution that is unguessable but also makes perfect sense when you find out what it is. All of those things remain the same. And that is the trick, isn't it? And we've talked on this show before about the artistry involved in, in particularly the kind of red herrings along the way that, that need, I, I think, need to make sense when you get to the end. You can't yeah. have a, a silly red herring in the middle that when you, when you learn the truth, you go back and think, well, hang on, why did he refuse to talk to the police? It was a good gag at the time. But, so that, but that's, that's hard. Uh, well, I have, a, I have a particular approach to plotting, which I call the gnocchi method, gnocchi as in the Italian food. Nice food. Well, 
spelled G-N-O-C-C-H-I. I have a gnocchi method of planning. And the reason I call it gnocchi is that gnocchi is half potato and half pasta. And my method of planning a crime novel, what I end up with at the end, at the end of my planning process is half a really detailed plan and half effectively a first draft because my plans are so detailed that they are, they're not properly written out like a, a novel, but they are effectively a form of first draft, but they're also a plan. And I can't decide whether they're more plan or more first draft. So that's why I called it the gnocchi draft because it, it's both things, just like gnocchi is pasta and potato. Um, and I find that if you do a really detailed plan, and make the planning process not just some boring chore. So many writers think, oh, planning, that sounds really boring. But actually, if you be a bit pretentious and call it story architecture, that immediately sounds more creative and exciting. And so I like to do that kind of planning and then edit the plan so that all the, the components of the plot are laid out and sorted into their proper places before the actual writing starts, so that when I come to the writing bit, all I have to do is look at what needs to happen in each chapter from the plan and then write it as well as I can. But at that point, I'm not worrying still about the plot. The plot is all decided and everything in it is in its proper position. So I actually do quite a lot of plot editing at the planning stage. And I find that really, really helps because when we're in the full flow of the writing, we often get quite caught up in that and swept away by it. And, and that's not the right part of our brain to then think, hang on, is the plot working? So that I like to divide writing up into the story architecture and then the actually realising what you've planned stages. Yeah, sounds right up my street. Of course, some people just simply sit there and write and make a good fist of it and it works for them. But that's that's definitely the sort of thing I do. The the knocky stage for you then, how many, is that roughly at novel length? Uh, no, drug no. usually between 50 and 80 pages a gnocchi draft okay. because it's, it's the whole novel, every single incident, anything that's important to be in, in each chapter is included, but it's in note form and as abbreviated as possible. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, uh, let's talk about your writing uh, then having had that introduction, because I think there's more to explore here. Better tell us, Sophie, how you started and uh, how you ended up with some pretty impressive deals with, uh, with uh, it's Harper, I think you, you write for. Uh, it's Harper Collins for the Poirot novels and it's Hodder and Stoughton for all my psychological thrillers. I've been with Hodder since my, very first crime novel was published in 2005. But how I started was that as a child, writing was always my main hobby. So I started writing very, very young, like f age five or six. I was making up stories, writing poems, copying them all out neatly into notebooks. Like I was taking my writing pretty seriously for a six-year-old. Mm. <laughs> and then it, it just became my my only real sort of, hobby other than like hanging out my main hobby as a kid and a teenager teenager was like hanging out with my mates but yeah. my only sort of other interest was writing and I just always did it prioritized it cared about it and at school at secondary school and at sixth form college I just sort of took for granted that I wouldn't pretty much neglect my schoolwork I mean I did the basics to get by but I never, ever, ever worked hard at a single piece of work that I had to do for school or sixth form college because I just wasn't interested really in any of that. I was interested in doing my writing, which I put loads of effort and energy into. And I mean, when I had my first proper job, I did the same. I, I deliberately, in fact, chose a job. You know, when I was at university, I was thinking, how can I get a job that's really boring and really easy that just pays the bills, but I don't have to let it occupy too much mental space so that all my mental energy can go towards my writing hobby. And I never thought it would really be anything other than a hobby. I thought, you know, I, I had a definite ambition to get published and I was determined that I was going to get published. I don't think it ever crossed my mind that it would even if I even if I got to a point where everything I was writing was being published, it never crossed my mind that I would actually be able to live on any money from it. I just thought that 
it does happen, but it doesn't happen generally. So I just never thought of that. And I would have been quite happy just publishing my stuff, whatever I was writing at the time, and having my boring, easy job. And, and that was the plan. Uh, and I stuck to that plan until I wrote Little Face, Hodder and Stoughton loved it and made an offer for it. And it was a two book deal. And I realized that the money I was being offered for, for those two books was quite a bit more than the money I was earning from my job, which at that point I had a different job, which I did not like. So I was like, I guess I seem to have turned into a writer. And yeah. if, I, if I gave up my job now, then I could live on the writing money. That's a bit weird. Maybe I should do that. So it kind of happened that way. But I was very prepared for it just to be like my favorite hobby forever. So out of interest, what was the job you chose that would be easy and give you time to write? Oh, it was an amazing job. I was a sort of library admin assistant, and that involved a lot of putting catalogue cards. So there were loads of catalogue cards about what books were in the library, and my job was to get each card and input it into a computer database. Right. And that was it. It was so easy. Perfect. It was so boring. I could do it almost in my sleep, and I'm a – very, very fast typist. I did a secretarial course at a certain point. It was like an extra option at sixth form. So I can type like 90 for 95 words a minute. So I did all my day's work in a couple of hours. Um, and I was working in this beautiful and really quiet sort of members club that was also an antiquarian library. So it was this beautiful old building and various business people and retired army types would come in and have their lunch in the sort of gentleman's club bit. And then people would take out antiquarian books to look at. And there was an amazing cook called Muriel who cooked lunch for everybody every day. And I was extremely excited about these delicious lunches that Muriel was providing. So it was a really perfect setup for someone who, you know, needed to earn money but wanted to have a very relaxing job and be able to focus on writing at the same time. So then you sent your manuscripts off to direct to the publishers or did you go to an agent? No, I had an agent. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, you've got an agent. agent. How did you get the agent? They queried and... Uh, well, so actually when I wrote my first crime novel, I already had an agent because years earlier, I'd written three other novels that were not crime and I got an agent for those and she was wonderful, but she then retired and I was sort of passed on to another agent at the same agency. So when I wrote Little Face, my first published crime novel, um, I had an agent, but my agent didn't like Little Face. I sent her the first hundred pages and the synopsis of the rest. And she said she didn't like it and she explained why she didn't like it. And I really disagreed with her. And I thought, she said there wasn't any mystery in it, and it's supposed to be a mystery novel. And there were three very definite mysteries in it within the first sort of two chapters. So I just thought, like, I know I might be biased because I'm the author, but I, I kind of think she might be wrong. And either way, we're not going to make progress in a client-agent relationship if she doesn't like my writing. And I'd written a book previously, which she had really disliked, which I thought was fine. So I was right, like, right. Maybe, you know, she'd never chosen me. See, she just inherited me. And it, I thought it's entirely possible that this woman does not like my writing. So I sort of probed in a tactful way. And she confirmed that she did, in fact, really dislike my writing. So I was like, okay, so now that we know this, yeah. clearly it's crazy for us to carry on working together. So I left that agency and I then sent the first hundred pages of Little Face, the same first hundred that she had disliked. I sent it to five other agents at the, on the same morning with a letter saying, this is not an exclusive submission. I'm sending this to five of you. I've just left my agent who really did not like this novel. And here are all the things she said that were wrong with it. I disagree, but what do I know? I'm the author. I'm obviously biased in its favor. What do you think? Um, and I sent that to five agents. By 10.30 the following morning, four of them had rung up on the actual telephone uh, and said, we love this. We want to meet you. We want to represent this book. And that was the fifth later got back to me and said she didn't like it. So, you know, as with anything, some people like it, some people don't. But the fact that four out of the five loved it and were very keen 
made me think, okay, my instinct was not wrong. This book does have potential, even if there's stuff about it that needs work. If, if four out of five people are ringing up before 10.30, that's a good sign. Uh, so then I went and met them all. I chose one. That agent relationship didn't work out either because although that agent did really help me to improve the book, we ended up in a slightly ludicrous situation where she would never agree that it was ready to go out to publishers. Every time I said, right, I've done this next round of edits. Are we ready to go out on submission? She was like, I just feel there's something more we could do. And this went on for like months and months and months. And I was kind of getting quite despondent because I was thinking, like, I've done 17 rounds of mm. edits. And don't and pu- I, once it goes to a publisher, don't they do some rounds of edits anyway? They do. They do. And I, but that's fine. Like you, I kind of was quite happy to accept that the agent would edit it, then the publisher would edit it. But the thing that became intolerable for me was that the agent eventually started to say, I know it needs more work, but I can't think of what it is that right. it needs. So I had just had my second child at that point, and I was having regular lunches with the, with the antenatal group mums. And it just so happened that one of the antenatal group mums was a tax lawyer. She still is a tax lawyer. Uh, and she happened to come around to my house for lunch when I was on the phone to this agent and I put the phone down and I was kind of quite in despair. And I said, she's, she's just saying it needs work, but she doesn't know what it needs and let her think about it. But then I'd already let her think about it for months and she hadn't thought of anything. And my friend said, hold on a minute. I am a tax lawyer. If I said to one of my clients, there's something wrong with your tax affairs, but I just can't put my finger on yeah. what it is, they will fire me and you need to fire this agent. I was like, oh yeah, why didn't I think of that? So then I parted company with that agent. And then a friend of mine who's a poet was describing his agent. And I just liked the sound. Of, he, he sounded quite eccentric, this agent that my poet friend was describing. I was like, yeah, maybe I should try a, a sort of totally different kind of agent. This guy sounds interesting and eccentric. I'm going to give him a try. So I sent Little Face to him and he rang up. Actually, I was out when he rang up. I was at my health club swimming and my husband answered the phone and the agent said to my husband, yeah, tell Sophie, I really like Little Face and I want to represent it. I think it's terrific. You know, I'm going to send it out. So he was like so keen that he was like almost sending it out before he'd even spoken to me. And I was like, okay, then. I came back from my swim and my husband was like, uh, I think you've got a new agent. He didn't seem to want to wait to speak to you. He just told me he was going ahead. And I was like, okay. And within days, literally days, um, he was telling me that Hodder were very, very interested. And could we go in for a meeting? We went in for a meeting and it just went so amazingly well. And I've been with Hodder ever since. And how many of your stories you'd written up until that point subsequently made it into published form or did you consider everything you'd done age five and six onwards as just practice and then you came up with new stories once you had a deal yeah everything was new after I had the deal um what I did do though was there was one plot element in one of my unpublished novels that was rightly unpublished because I wasn't a mature enough writer at the point when I wrote it but there was one idea that I just loved that I just kind of took out and and sort of just initially just put on my sort of mental shelf of things I might use later. And then I used it in 2009 in a standalone thriller. Okay. But and- generally, generally I, I, I didn't want to go back to, cause I could see how much better little face was. Well, I could see how much better the version of little face that Hodder read in it and bought. That was so much better than my original version of little face. And then little face, the original version was so much better than the book before. So I knew I was improving book to book. And so I didn't want to go back and publish anything that I knew was worse. Sure. And we should say you've had some fabulous success. I mean, you've hit the top 10 lists, uh, certainly in the UK, in the US as well. I think you've, you've done well. Yeah. yeah. So I've been a, a New York Times bestseller um, once, and I've been a Sunday Times bestseller many, many times my last but one thriller haven't they grown got to number four in the uk top 10 and was a richard and judy 
book club book and has sold amazing well I think because it's very high concept that is one of my most high concept books but Little Face the first one sold incredibly well it sold into like 35 countries was a bestseller in many of those countries and here what was really interesting was it was a word of mouth bestseller so when Hodder acquired it they said to me we absolutely love this book we think it's brilliant please don't expect it to be a bestseller because it's quite subtle. It's quite sophisticated. So we're going to aim to sell like 10,000 copies. That will be amazing. And then we'll build on that. And we're really committed. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. 10,000 copies. I'd be very happy with that. But then by a few months after it coming out, it had already sold 40,000 copies and it had just kind of taken off. And then the sales just carried on and carried on and it was selling all over the world. And it became a sort of, word of mouth phenomenon that no one had expected to be a bestseller, um, which was amazing. Like, you know, Hodder and I and my agent, we were all just thrilled because, you know, we would have genuinely been really happy if it had sold 10,000 copies. Yeah. How did you find the experience of working with a publisher and agent? I mean, it seems to be a lot of people you're then collaborating with where from a self-published point of view, very often, although you hire an editor, a lot of this is done alone. It feels to me a different writing experience. It is a different writing experience. And what's interesting is, so I was very lucky. My agent, that, that same agent that I ended up with for Little Face, he is still my agent. And Hodder, my editor at Hodder, she is still my editor. Hodder is still my publisher. And because those relationships are so brilliant and they work so well, and like my editor is just amazing, my agent is amazing, I am really, really happy in those relationships because they just work. Um, so the you know the, the reason I'm still traditionally published rather than self-published is because I was lucky enough to end up in relationships that where you know I was just I, I felt and still feel as though I'm just with the ideal people and I want to carry on working with them. But what's interesting is. Well, firstly, when I published Little Face, self-publishing wasn't a thing in the way that it is now. Um, but I think temperamentally, I am actually more, I wouldn't say more suited to being a self-published writer, but if I were starting out now, I would consider self-publishing as a brilliant option. Uh, and I think, you know, as I say, I remain traditionally published because I've been very lucky to have great relationships and great results. But my my instincts, I think, have more in common with the self-published writers that I know, because I can imagine a situation where if you were with an agent who you didn't feel was great for representing your work, and if you were with a publisher who you didn't feel was, you know, as great as my publisher is, I can imagine thinking, well, why wouldn't I set up a self-publishing operation? Because then I, you know, then yeah. I've got more freedom and more control. So I'm always, I, I run a coaching program for writers called Dream Author, Dream Author Coaching. And one of the things I'm constantly saying when I'm coaching writers to help them create success, I'm constantly saying, you know, please, please don't regard the traditional route to publishing as in any way innately superior to the self-published route. It simply is not. But what's interesting is so many writers, especially people of my generation, I mean, I'm 50 and people of my age and older, because we all grew up in a climate where if you wanted to be properly published, you were traditionally mm. published. That was the way. I think a lot of people still have this kind of almost unquestioned core belief that somehow traditional publishing is a bit better somehow. Yeah, and you fall back on indie publishing. It's exactly. yeah, it's not if like your it, we, career doesn't work. Whereas I think both, both, both as a traditionally published writer and as a self-published writer, it is possible to create massive success, and it's also possible to fail. And, yes. and one is not better than the other in any way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I they have the advantages and disadvantages. Obviously, both of them do. But um, I, I, if I were starting out now, I would want to look at all the options, weigh up the advantages and disadvantages, and, and probably actually aim to do a mixture of both. Yeah. And um, one thing, what when you we'll talk about your your teaching in a second, but your when you do talk to students, aspiring writers today, 
particularly perhaps younger ones who who don't have um, uh, particularly set in their ways about how they're going to do it. How do you advise them to go through the process that you go through, the sort of third party who looks at your script and says to them, says to you, it needs a rewrite. It's not quite working. As a self-published author, I sometimes think there's a temptation not to go through that phase, even though you do give it out to an editor, you can choose to give it to a dev editor, but ultimately it's your decision what you do with that information. Yeah. Whereas in your environment, you are basically being told this needs a rewrite and your books, by the sounds of it, get better as a result of that process. Yeah, my editor always spots things that need improving and she I've never disagreed with her. Whenever she says this doesn't quite work, this is a problem that needs to be resolved. I don't think I've ever disagreed with her even once. Um but what I what I would advise, and I do advise my my dream authors, as I call them, the people in my coaching program, is that whether you are going to take someone's editorial comments and and implement them or not, it's it's I believe vitally important to have somebody. It doesn't have to even be a paid editor. It can be, but it could be like I have. A, a close friend who's a writer who is such a brilliant editor and she reads everything of mine before my editor, my proper editor even sees it because I want her feedback. Um, so it doesn't matter who it is and whether they're a professional editor, what matters is somebody else, somebody intelligent whose judgment you trust reading your work and giving you feedback. What that does is it helps to develop and hone and, finesse your own inner editorial sense so i believe all of us especially i mean maybe not all of us but anyone who reads a lot and has a lot of practice at writing we all have our sort of inner editorial wisdom that knows what works and what doesn't work but we often don't realize we've got that wisdom and we often only know what we think about our own work once we hear someone else's opinion and then we find that we're either thinking Yes, of course, that would be better. Or no, that's a ridiculous suggestion. I'm definitely not doing that. So it's not that we need the editorial feedback so that we can obey it slavishly and do everything someone else says, because why on earth would we want to hand over our power in that way? But it's useful to get editorial feedback of a substantive kind because it really helps you to it kind of provokes your own inner editor to pop out and go, I know what I think needs to happen here. And that's the really valuable bit because after being edited for many years, I now have my own inner editor, which means I am able to cut out a load of stuff that isn't going to work before anyone else has to be bothered and disturbed by it and tell me it's wrong. I'm just like, no, I, my inner editor can tell that's wrong. I can fix it. Um, and, and we can't really build our own inner editorial sense without having editorial feedback from other people. So even the bad feedback is so useful. Yeah. And, and someone says, change your ending. It doesn't work. Change it to this. If your response is, what do you mean it doesn't work? It works brilliantly because this is the only way that da 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 da. And you're like, oh, now I know why I want this ending. Yes. And do you find it even now when you write a, a a draft a manuscript you go through that process you carry something forward each time you learn something new each time absolutely yeah 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 well let's talk about your teaching then because in addition to being a best-selling author you are a teacher not just with your dream team dream dream authors dream but, al author. but also you're speaking to us from Cambridge University but just down the road from me actually uh, here in the UK and you're actually teaching at one of the most prestigious universities in fact they would say in Cambridge the most prestigious <laughs> university in the world of course uh, so tell us how is that something obviously you're passionate about i guess wanting to teach yeah. so i i was approached by uh, cambridge university and asked if i wanted to create a crime and thriller writing master's degree and i knew that if i said yes then i would get to teach this degree program at maddingley hall which is one of the most beautiful buildings in cambridge and I just thought that would actually be idyllic to teach crime and thriller writing at Cambridge University in this beautiful building. So I couldn't resist, even though I was already quite busy <laughs> with writing my books and running my dream author coaching program. I just couldn't resist. So um, I said yes. So I'm now the course director of the crime and thriller master's program at Cambridge University. 
and I'm there now, which is why I've got, you can see, I've got a slightly institutional yeah. style. What to do in the event of a fire on my door. I would not have that on my door at home. Just to clarify. <laughs> this is if you're watching uh, on YouTube, yes. It's, uh... Oh, yeah. So I teach crime writing at Cambridge University. And my dream author program isn't teaching, it's coaching. Yeah. It's, a very, it's basically life and career coaching for writers and anyone who wants to write. Okay, and how does that operate? How do how do you um how how does that structure itself for your authors? So it's a fourteen month membership program, and it's all online. There are opportunities to meet in person because we have regular dream author retreats at, initially, uh, and so far they've all been in one location, but there will be other locations in due course. Um, but mainly it's online, and there are coaching calls where you can get live coaching there are webinars where you can request for coaching that's kind of more anonymous if you don't want to be identified uh, there are podcasts there are workbooks there are exercises um and the, there's basically coaching in every possible format that i can think of and when you're in the program you can ask for coaching at any point so let's say your agent has just written to you and said, I don't like the new draft. In fact, I think it's terrible and I'm not willing to send it to the publisher. And you feel absolutely devastated. You can go to the Ask Sophie page of the Dream Author Coaching website and say, can I please be coached in the next webinar because I feel like giving up. Um, and then whatever, any challenge or issue or emotional or psychological thing that comes up, I coach people on, on those things with a, with a view to kind of putting every writer and everyone who wants to write in the position where they can become their own best and strongest ally for the rest of their writing life. Because a lot of writers, you know, they're fine and they feel happy when things are going well. But when there's a negative result, like a book gets turned down or they find out their new book didn't sell and they get dumped by their publisher or their book that they adore has been rejected by everyone and they don't know what to do next. Generally, people kind of think, well, what do I do? It's all doom and gloom. I feel terrible and I don't know where to turn. The aim of the Dream Author program is to coach writers and give them all the skills they need so that whatever challenging or disappointing or upsetting thing has just happened they know how to be their own strongest advocate and how to think about what's happened in a way that gives them a direction to move forward. So that, I mean, what I always say in Dream Author is, yes, we're all going to get disappointing results sometimes. We're all going to get fails as well as wins. And when those fails happen, we are going to feel disappointed and gutted and all the negative, like there's no way around that. But we don't have to make those disappointing events mean anything terminal. We don't have to make them mean I'm never going to succeed because that's not a fact that is true. Like just because a disappointing thing has happened in the past, the very recent past, doesn't mean anything about what's going to happen in future. But if you make that disappointment mean it's so hard to be a writer, I might as well give up, then you're going to really discourage yourself and probably give up and then you really can't succeed. Whereas if, as I always did when I was getting rejected by publishers in the very early days, um, I would make a disappointment mean nothing more than, well, that was disappointing. I didn't get the result I wanted on this occasion. Right, and now what? What's the next thing I can do to create the success that I know is gonna be coming to me at some point? And there's a huge difference between those two things, right? I never, even when I was most disappointed at having just had a novel rejected, I never even considered believing that I was not capable of becoming a successful writer. I was just like, oh, I'm disappointed it didn't happen on this occasion. Right. What's the next strategy? So that it's because it's definitely going to happen. So how do I make it happen? Um, so it's really dream of the coaching is all about looking at the, the gap between the facts of any situation and what we decide to make it mean and how we can actually choose our thoughts and beliefs on purpose in order to create the feelings that will drive the actions that will create the results that we want. And so once the reason the Dream Author program is 14 months is that if it, if it were too short, 
people would think, yeah, that all sounds great, but I, I don't know how to practice it. But with 14 months of very immersive content, by the end of that 14 months, everyone has learned the skills and they are able to coach themselves so that they can carry on creating success and going after whatever their writing dreams are. And is it this mind, mindset, I think, is probably a good good word for, for what you're talking about. Is this something that's naturally been a part of the way that you operate or have you learned to be positive in those situations? So both. Um, so naturally, I am very positive, optimistic, and assuming that if I want to do something, then they'll, I'll find a way to make it happen. I do have the huge advantage of just being naturally like that. <laughs> I am a glasses half full person. But I have also had extensive coaching myself, and I have learned a lot that's kind of almost turbocharged my tendency in that direction. So I would say it's probably about 50-50. Okay. And there's there's some of the some of the things I I teach and coach on in Dream Author were things that I used to think of as like, it's probably a bit weird that I think like this, so I just won't tell anyone. I think in this way that the rest of the world doesn't think. I won't mention it and I'll pretend to be more normal. And then I had lots of mindset coaching myself. And I thought, oh, hang on, the way I'm being encouraged to think about things is how I do anyway. But I thought it was just me being weird and kind of slightly deluded, believing I could create huge success. But actually, if you believe you can create huge success, then you feel great. And then you are so much more likely to take the actions that do, in fact, create success. So, um, yeah, I would say it's 50-50. I had a head start by being a natural optimist, but I've learned so much from the coaching programs that I've been part of as well. And in the 14 months, is there opportunities for manuscript specific feedback or is it more general yeah. approach? Do you, you, you read at some point or someone reads and you give specific? Yeah, I'm very, I'm very obsessive and I want dream author to just be the best thing ever for writers. I want, I want writers to join dream author and go, Oh my God, this is the best thing ever. Like, how is this all possible? and so affordable at the same time. So I try and do everything. And, uh, and, and people join the program and within weeks they're saying like, I don't know how, like this is just the best thing ever. So that's been really nice because that was my aim and that is happening. People who join the program love it. So if they say my, my manuscript has been rejected by everyone, I will say, send me exactly what the publishers have been sent. Send me your submission package and I will look at it and I bet I can find explanations for why they might have all been rejecting it. And I always can. I always say, you know, change these five things and it will become a more irresistible prospect for a, a publisher. And, and often that fixes it. And then they, they go and, and, and then next thing I hear, they're getting published or, you know. Okay. It, it's amazing the you know, the results that they are, that my dream authors are creating once they start to realise that facts are just facts and we can choose to make them mean whatever we want. So an agent ignores you for six weeks. Most writers would think, oh, maybe my novel's so bad that they just can't bear to get back to me. And I always say, no, what if it means that agent is terrible at getting back to people? It may not mean anything about your novel might be a masterpiece. The agent might be a crap communicator or your novel might be brilliant but not to that agent's taste so we don't always have to go so often a writer will tell you if you say to any writer how's the writing going right they will tell you what they think is just a factual report this is just the situation you ask me how things are going let me tell you how badly things are going but i can always hear that only half of that or even less is the facts and the rest is the negative meanings they're giving to everything like Obviously, it's all doomed. Obviously, I'm just going to sell fewer and fewer copies. Obviously, I'm going to be living under a bridge by this time next year. And you're like, hang on a minute, you're getting all that from the agent hasn't responded yet. Mm. But that's where the coaching can come in really handy. Well, you better tell people where they can find more information about the, uh, the coaching. The yeah, dreamauthorcoaching.com. Okay. Uh, and there's, there's a, a newsletter 
So at, the, at the bottom of the home page, you can sign up to join the Dream Author newsletter. I don't send out newsletters terribly often because everything I ever sign up to sends out too many newsletters. So only when I've got like, I'll often do a special offer or I'll give away a freebie. That's when I send out newsletters, um, but I don't send them just for the sake of it. Okay. And the Masters uh, Cambridge, how would people find out more information about that? Uh, if you Google Institute of Continuing Education, Cambridge University, Crime and Thriller, our page will pop up and there'll be some dark black and white noirish photo saying, here's how you apply for the Crime and Thriller program. I expect nothing less. Well, Sophie, <laughs> the time has whizzed by. Um, uh, I've been enthralled by it. It's been really interesting listening to you. So thank you very much indeed. Good luck with the, uh, the future writing and the, and the coaching program. And um, let's chat again in the future. I'm sure we could just probably pick one aspect of writing and spend 40 minutes talking about it with you. So Definitely. No, I'd love to come on again because I do, you know, I'm so interested in self-publishing. In my head, it is definitely something I'm going to do one day. I just, I'm waiting for the time to be right when I'm slightly less uh, busy with other things. But there's no way that I'm going to get to the end of my writing career and never have self-published right. a book. It might, be, it might be something you start and never look back on with the... Um, yeah, might be. But uh, <laughs> yeah, well, you know where we are if you need our help for that front as well. So we'd, we'd like, like to be a part of it. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to let you go. I need to go. Thank you so much indeed for coming on. It's been brilliant. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There you go. Sophie Hanna, really good to talk to her and writing a, an Agatha Christie novel. That's a bit like, I suppose they've done it with Ian Fleming's Bonds, haven't they? Um, who is it? Uh, uh, Birdsong Man. Sebastian Falks, I think, did the first... Maybe the Horowitz. First, there have been a few. Horowitz has done done them as well, um, but yeah, big boots to fill. And, and Agatha Christie, I mean, Bond, I suppose, delivers Bond. Agatha Christie has to deliver not just something that looks and feels like it's got to deliver that intrigue that she was brilliant at that that twist, getting all of that. I would feel nervous. I would feel nervous. Wild about racism. That. Yeah, well, I think we did talk a little bit about you know the sensitivities and stuff uh, involved in that. <laughs> not as bad as in right, the the, you know, the biggest selling fiction writer of all time, it wasn't that, it's was Shakespeare. Um, okay. But as she's second. In fact, she's joint first. Yeah. Just looking at Wikipedia, the minimum estimated sells 2 billion. Uh, 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 units. That, yeah. That, I mean, I suppose it's possible. It sounds mm -hmm. like quite a lot. But yes, Barbara Cartland, Danielle Steele, Harold Robbins, George Simenon, all half a million. But yes, um, yeah, so she's certainly up there. Yeah, yeah, it's, now, it's interesting to take on something like that, to take on another author without um, being a pastiche of the author. So there yeah. is a, it is a difficult um, balancing act to towards something that feels contemporary. Also, they may that, that may actually not want it to feel contemporary. They may want it to feel at, of the time, but without yeah. doing that in a way where you know where crop bar is twirling his moustache or you know all of that kind of stuff we can very easily slip over into the slightly clumsy pastiche so yeah yeah very interesting one to, to try and get right yeah she's a very thoughtful writer sophie and as i say she does this master's degree i did look it up after the interview and i have to say it's quite expensive it's either it's best part of ten thousand pounds a year and it's a two-year course so you're going to spend 19 odd thousand pounds knocking on thirty thousand dollars uh, to do it but it's Cambridge University and um, we gave the details towards the end of the, the interview on that so thank you very much to our, our guest Sophie I fully expect next time we talk to Sophie in a year or two's time that she will have dipped her toe fully into the indie market and I think she's the sort of author who will fly uh, in the indie world but uh, we'll be uh, interested to see that okay just a reminder, uh, $25 to buy a digital pass to the self-publishing show 2022. This will be a fully produced package delivered to you after the show uh, of every session, $25. I think for the information uh, available in that package, I think that's a steal, but it's going to go up to $40 on the 30th of June. So after the show from 30th of June for the rest of the year, it'll be $40. You get an early bird chance to buy it for $25. You get to selfpublishingformula.com forward slash digital. And that, I think, Mark, is that. I can see you're now distracted on your phone. What are you looking no, at saying, now? I'm just taking a picture for you. There's oh, a, the, the swans. There's, uh, there's four yeah. swans that are just swimming around. I said off camera. This is all very, very well, rural. You need, to turn, you need to put a webcam on so we can watch the swans the whole yeah, time. Yeah, I've, te I've been teaching them. I'm not actually going to try and kill them. I actually want to just feed them. And uh, yesterday we had a breakthrough. And now and now they've the swan who uh, had the feed I gave was told all his mates, 
So yeah. they're all they're all there waiting impatiently for me to go and uh, to me to go and feed them. So well, your your um your barn is perfectly set up actually to mount an outdoor all weather webcam on on the outside. And that and there's quite a few of those bird ones you can tune. When my father in law unfortunately was was palliatively ill. And he was a big bird. I looked up a whole list of these webcams. You can sit there watching someone's garden in Savannah in well, Georgia. I've got an, I have or... a Nest security floodlight on the uh, barn shooting out. So, yeah, it would work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Feed that into the web and let people watch your swans. Just make sure it's not a reflection so they can see inside. Yes. Uh, very good point. Okay. Right. Thank you very much indeed to our guest, Sophie Hannah. Thank you to the team in the background who put this show together. Thank you, Mark. And we will be back next week. So, look, we, where are we now in terms of the, the conference? It is the 14th today. It's, so it's, two, it's, two, it's two weeks today. Two weeks today. Okay. Mark as we I record be... this. So, as this goes out, it'll be less than two weeks. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so we'll have one more podcast before the conference itself, and we'll remind you of those details again then. Right, that's it. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, all that remains for me to say is it's a goodbye from him. And a goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with the self-publishing show.